Hello and welcome. This is Gray Hughes of Gray Hughes Investigates on YouTube. This channel evaluates all aspects of true crime. As you are aware, videos and live streams in this genre often discuss elements of crime that may be disturbing to some viewers. If necessary, take the precautions needed to avoid these feelings. Factual information related to cases is the key to fostering rational true crime discussions. Fortunately, you will find that here. Please hit the like button only once, share the video, and subscribe if you like my content. Thank you very much for watching. Going on, freaks. Huh. What does quilt hello mean? Um, anyways, let's see. First time commenting. Can you see it, anyone? <laughs> Might want to check out the date on when that account was created. So I guess I'd start off, I don't have Delphi written in the title or anything like that, but um, on the, uh, remember that special that we watched the other day? Or the one on CW that, that I was in actually. Hey, thank you, Terry Bolton. <laughs> All right, thanks for, thanks for trying. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, if you remember the uh, document, oh yeah. So the reason I was a little bit late is I gave Blue his medicine before. I have a little alarm that goes off, but I figured, oh wait, I set it for 5.35, so I went in there and uh, had to do his medicine. Yeah, it's gotta be the same time every single day, every, you know, 12 hours apart. Look at him right there. Boy, he's just like old school Blue. <laughs> I always like watching him when he does stuff like that. You know, it makes it seem like he's just totally content, not sick or anything. Yeah, he's just cleaning his, you know. <laughs> so lick the toe, make it wet, and then cram it in my ear. Hey, thanks, Eugene. There you go. There you go. <laughs> well, thank you too, K. Me. Yeah, we're getting, we are getting close to the end of the month here. Three days left. So, anyways, the on that special. Do you guys you guys remember the? Hold on, I got the uh, her name is Connie. The or is that? Hold on a second, let me make sure I got the right. Yeah, Connie. She was the ex girlfriend of Ron Logan. And on there, remember how she said, "Oh man, as soon as I saw that that picture, I knew it was him. I knew it was him." Right. 
And then also, I think it was, I'm not sure. I mean, it could be that Connie just told Barbara McDonald some incorrect information, but uh, what was said also was that uh, Connie was, you know, after they talked, her and Barbara McDonald, she started commenting on Facebook. But some screenshots have come to light where she was on Facebook right at the beginning. And uh, one of them said, here, I'll go over to this one right here. It says, I knew it was him before his picture was even exposed. <laughs> well, that's exactly the opposite that you said, right? So then that sort of, and then I heard his voice and, I, and then it then convinced me. All right, so that means even before you heard his voice and before you saw the picture, you thought it was Ron Logan. And you know why? Because you're biased. You hated him. <laughs> you, you know, So of course it's going to be Ron Logan. Because this, this, that's what this is saying. Before his picture was he ever exposed, uh, and then, like I knew it was him before the picture was even exposed, right? And then I heard his voice, and then it convinced me. <laughs> I mean, that's crazy, right? So you knew it was him before you even saw the picture, but then you heard the voice. Uh -huh. And then there's other uh, comments, for, for example, like Doug Rice, back on, in March of 2017, he's talking about what Connie has said. She's been on Facebook since the beginning, not some sort of new revelation dug up, you know, that kind of thing. All right. So I think you can just, well, I mean, it's not even really um, sleuthy or anything. We already know it's not Ron Logan on the bridge. Okay. Everybody knows that. This stuff right here, though, uh, proves that she's just out there hating on Ron Logan, especially now that he's not alive. It's really easy to start blaming everything on him. But she was talking about how she thought it was him back in 2017, but she knew it was him before she even heard him or saw him. Or, you know, maybe this is what it's saying here is I knew it was him before his picture was ever exposed. So, I mean, so what, what this does say what I'm saying. So before the picture was even exposed, she knew it was him. But then I heard his voice, meaning, so now she sees the picture and then here's the voice. And then I was convinced. Well, you were convinced. Well, up here you said, I knew it was him and then you became convinced after you heard the voice, but you were already convinced up here, right? I knew it was him uh, just by the mere fact that they were found on his property, it sounds like, because of your experience with him. You see, now I'm sort of wondering, though, if uh, did she fib to the FBI? Okay, so here's the thing. Is she the girlfriend in Ron Logan's search warrant? Is she the girlfriend in, in that search warrant? That's what I, w I would wonder about, because if it is, that means, because remember how that said almost that exact same thing? That's why I think it's her. She said in Ron Logan's, oh, when I saw the picture, I knew it was him. Something like that. So is she not telling the truth <laughs> to the FBI at the time? Weird, huh? Weird. Maybe she hasn't told the truth to a few people. No, that, that wouldn't do that, Cindy. That wouldn't do that. She hadn't seen his face or anything. No, you, you, you're, you're just, man, unbelievable. Yeah, no, it wouldn't do that. She just w hated Ron Logan, so of course it's him. That's why she was saying that. She hadn't seen the video or the audio, heard the audio, and she was already saying it's him. How would she have a clue? Ridiculous. And it wasn't Ron Logan, so we, we know that, right? Mm-hmm. Did you see the Virginia missing couple killed by fugitives? Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, yeah, I saw that. I, well, I haven't been covering it, so I'm, I'm not talking about it. That's why I'm talking about something else right now. I'm not sure if you could tell. But, uh, yeah, so I bet it was the person uh, that was in the Ron Logan probable cause document, or the search warrant, I mean. No, it was the complete opposite of that, Cindy. You just re you just repeated it back the complete opposite of what she said. She thought she said she knew it was him before his picture was even exposed, and then I heard his voice, and then I was convinced. So she was convinced before anybody even knew anything. Uh, just because it was on his property, and then later when she heard the voice in the video, she was convinced. Yeah, so it's not true that when she saw the picture, she just knew it was him. Remember that? She knew it was him even before. And that shows that she was extremely biased right there. Well, you don't get it because you just wrote the exact opposite up there. Uh, seems like a reasonable conclusion she was the girlfriend in the warrant. Yeah, it doesn't, doesn't seem, um, <laughs> it doesn't seem reasonable to me. You know, if she hadn't seen, she said she knew it was him before seeing the picture or the audio. She just, the mere fact that it was on the property. Uh, let's see. But, you know, I guess everybody has, thinks differently. <laughs> it's just, to me, it's just obvious. 100% bias witness has no credibility whatsoever. Um, and unfortunately, it was sort of just used to help promote the ridiculous theory that Ron Logan is the killer in the Delphi case. And he wasn't. Oh, I see what you're saying. I get it. Not her conclusion. Uh, it doesn't matter. It's obvious you... Right. So, if you just look at it like that, Ron Logan's not the guy in the bridge. So, her saying, I knew it was him, just proves that she was biased, and then you just sort of proved her bias by her saying that um, she knew it was him before even seeing the picture or the audio, right? And there you go, there's the answer. I say the X is full. Well, of course. I mean, it's just... <laughs> the thing is, is I don't think there's any rational person who looks at the guy on the bridge and thinks that's Ron Logan. Okay, um, I don't, you're, it's just, it's almost looks like Mickey Mouse compared to Donald Duck to me. I, the guy is totally different body shape, has, has no similarities whatsoever to that picture, other than maybe he wears some clothing that has some general similarities from time to time. <laughs> it's ridiculous. And then to keep believing that, even after you're given information that completely and utterly proves that Richard Allen is the guy standing on platform one and the guy that the three girls saw and is the person that Abby and Libby saw at the end of the bridge where Libby filmed him, okay? That's, that is Richard Allen. crazy. Mm -hmm. All right. So anyways, uh, I'm looking at different screenshots. There's people's names on them and stuff like that. But, you know, uh, like these are some of the, I'll just tell you what she said in the past. I knew it was him before his picture was ever exposed. And then I heard his voice and then it convinced me. 
And then she said something like, I hope so. It's been a gut feeling from the beginning. Uh, then, I don't know who to talk to. I've tried, and that's the best I can do. Like, she, people are, she's communicating with people right at the beginning of the, the case uh, to see if she can contact, like, the police or something. Um, I've called five times, no one comes to, uh, no one seems to care what I have to say, it's eating at me, and then a guy named Doug Rice, he's passed away, he had a lot of pretty good information, but he had a lot of really ridiculous ideas, he said, I have no clue who Connie was referring to, but the thread she made left comments on originally posted on March 2nd 2017 so that's when she was already commenting less like right around three weeks after the murders so there you go all right all right but yes you guys we're getting close to the end of the month as I say nightly, if you're able to help support the channel, that would be great. We've sort of fallen on a massive lull here recently again, and I'm not sure what else to say. <laughs> okay, not sure what else to say. But that's what allows us to be, you know, like it helps support me and do what I do, but it also allows us to do all the great stuff that we do throughout the year. Uh, yeah, I don't know if I have the bots. Where are those? I'm trying to turn the bots on, but I'm not even sure if those work too well. But uh, should be up and running now. So tonight's kind of like the uh, old school kind of shows that we used to do. And we always did pretty well during those shows too. But uh, scary times, even giving them a shot these days. But uh, let's see. So the first one, there's a woman named Kathy Lynn Boswell. Well, let, how about this? Let's do the Elijah Vu document first. All right. That's more of a recent case. Then we'll get into the old ones. But. Are they the same? Aren't they the same thing, pretty much? Or? Okay, let me let me save these out. Hold on. Hold on, I'm just saving off some single PDF files. Thank you, Kubi. Yeah, it looks different. This is the, these are the different charges that the mother got. Neglecting a child, 
Specified harm did not occur in child under six years of age. Then obstructing an officer and obstructing an officer again, I guess. Uh, says was doing act of official capacity and with lawful authority obstructed. So it's probably two officers that interviewed her and she gave the wrong information, something like that. So we'll go to the probable cause portion here. Deacon, the complainant alleges he informed by the reports of Megan Klumpian. <laughs> Couldn't we just have some simple names here? Known to complain it to be a detective with the Two Rivers Police Department and Detective Lieutenant Jacob Glazer of the Two Rivers Police Department that the incident occurred in the city of Two Rivers, Manitowoc County, Wisconsin. On February 20th, 2024, the Two Rivers Police Department was notified by dispatch that Jesse Vang called 911 at 10.59 a.m. reporting that he was babysitting a three-year-old child victim. Vang reported, let's see, so uh, Vang himself uh, called at around 11 in the morning reporting that he was babysitting a three-year-old child victim. Vang reported that while watching the child, he fell asleep. Hmm. Really? Uh, when, when he woke up, the child was missing. Law enforcement responded to the Vang residence at 3918 Michicot Road, apartment 102 in Two Rivers. And that's over here. Thanks, 8675309. So here's the apartment right here. Well, thank you, Barbara Town. So it's in this apartment complex right there. That was the dumpster where they found a shoe. When he woke up, the child was missing. Law enforcement responded to Vang's residence at 3918 Mishcott Road, apartment 102 in Two Rivers, Wisconsin, in an attempt to locate the victim. Law enforcement has been unsuccessful in locating victim as of February 26th, which is today. On February 20th, 2024, Detective Clumpian of the Two Rivers Police Department spoke with Vang at the residence at 3918 Mishkash Road, apartment 102. Vang said he is in a relationship with the victim's mother, Katrina Bauer. Vang stated that victim has been staying with him recently. Vang stated he has been trying to help Bauer correct victim's bad behavior. <laughs> it's a three-year-old kid for God's sakes. My kid was doing algebra when he was three, Gray. Thank you. Yeah, so Vang stated he has been trying to help Bauer, the mother, correct victim's bad behavior. Vang stated that he has been assisting with the care of victim for approximately one month, but not continuously. Vang stated that on Tuesday, or on today's date of 2020-24, he woke up with his autistic teenage son. Vang helped uh, his son with getting on the bus at approximately 7.30 a.m. Vang stated victim was still asleep after he walked his son out to the bus. Vang stated he woke up the victim at approximately, I'll just say Elijah instead of victim. So Vang stated he woke up Elijah at approximately 8 in the morning and brought him into the bedroom with him. Vang stated that he shut the door and Vang fell asleep. Uh, let's see, Vang stated, you mean he, he fell, <laughs> that just sounds weird to keep saying the name. Vang stated he woke up at approximately 11 a.m. 
and found that vic the victim was gone. Vang said he then called 911 to report victim missing. On February 20th, 2024, Detective Lieutenant Glazer spoke with Bauer. Bauer stated that victim has been in the care of Jesse Vang for approximately one week. Bauer resides in the Wisconsin Dells. Had been in care of Jesse for a week. Yeah, I don't know. No. Uh, Bauer stated she dropped off victim with Jesse Vang on February 12th in Fond du Lac, Wisconsin. She intended on victim or Elijah coming back to Wisconsin Dells on Friday, February 23rd, 2024. On February 20th, 2024, DCI agent Neil Lofi did speak with Katrina Bauer and denied that she was in the Manitowoc County area on February 16th and 17th, 2024. The Cle uh, Detective Klumpian is aware that pursuant to search warrants, law enforcement did conduct forensic extractions of Jesse Vang and Katrina Bauer's cell phone after they were consensually turned over to law enforcement. Based on analysis of these cell phones, specifically location data obtained uh, that law enforcement obtained information that contradicted Katrina Bauer's statement that she had not been in the Manitowoc area on February 16th through the 17th, 2024. Law enforcement located messages from Vang to Bauer at approximately 6.39 p.m. hours on February 17th where Vang tells Bauer that he is angry that Elijah overfilled his diaper with poop and pee, and that Vang gave victim a cold shower. Vang noted that Elijah was clean but scared. Detective Lieutenant Glazer spoke with Katrina Bauer, and she stated that Jesse Vang was the enforcer of rules in the relationship, and that was the reason for sending Elijah to stay with Vang. She discussed with him the limits of what discipline she uh, did not want used. <laughs> okay, so she tried to protect her kid by saying, well, you know, don't use baseball bats and these kind of things, but, you know, these are the things you can do. What a, what a joke, Jesus. Other than that, she is fine with what other discipline Vang uh, decided to enforce. She gave examples of discipline, including praying, saying, he was sorry and going over rules the victim is supposed to uh, victim is supposed to be memorizing so he's supposed to be so Elijah was supposed to be memorizing rules at no point did she admit she was in the city of two rivers between February 12 2024 20, and February 20th or had any face-to-face -face contact with Elijah she said she said she she said she was man that's hard she said she was discussing behavior issues with Vang around Thanksgiving of 2023, and he said she needed to try harder to stop the behavior. Bauer stated she wanted Vang to teach Elijah, by example, how to be a man at three years old. Really? She said the first time victim had gone to stay with Vang, Elijah had, uh, went to go to stay with Vang without her was in January of 2024, just a month ago. She said the past week was the longest time Elijah had stayed with Vang without her being there. Detective Lieutenant Glazer said while, uh, while talked about this week, I don't know, while talked about this week, she admitted she had been in Two Rivers on February 16th, 2024. She said she left the Wisconsin Dells around 6 or 7 and arrived in Two Rivers late at night. So maybe that's when he was killed. She saw a victim on the couch, but he was tired. She said she left early in the morning on February 17th. She was confronted about being in Two Rivers on a different day, and she did admit she was in Two Rivers on February 14th, 2024, for a period of time and then went back home. So she's been back and forth a oh, whole bunch of times here. Vang consented to meeting with law enforcement 
at TRPD and agreed to a consensual interview. During the course of the interview conducted by Detective Michael Herman of the Manitowoc County Sheriff's Office, Vang made consensual statements in regards to his recent interactions with victim, with uh, Elijah. Vang stated that Elijah is afraid of him, then corrected himself and stated that he respects me. He stated that they put Elijah here as a punishment for his bad behavior. They were trying to teach him how to be, be good here and good at home. Vang indicated that he's trying to make him understand what's go that going home is like a privilege for him. <laughs> well, no, it's not. It's where he should be because, you know, he's a kid. He's three years old and he's got a mom, you know. Uh, Vang stated that Elijah was disciplined using timeouts. He described the timeouts as being standing for periods of time for one or three hours. Wow. A three-year-old, you're making stand for one or three hours? Jesus. During this time, victim was required to pray or say, I am sorry, mommy. I mean, is, wow, did you think he was helping himself with these things? I mean, this is ridiculous. Vang reported that victim was in timeout for the majority of his time with Vang, and it was intended as a form of boot camp. Other than getting into things, Vang was unable to identify specific bad behaviors which required a timeout. Vang reported that victim is not potty trained and that he is still wearing diapers. Vang advised that he changed the victim's diaper at least once per day. On the evening of February 19, 2024, Vang changed victim's diaper prior to him going to bed at uh, 8 or 9 p.m. He then watched Ready Player One. He stated that Elijah was not watching the movie as Vang put him in punishment. He stated that Elijah will stand in the corner or stand by the bed by, by me, Vang stated. He gets pretty tired from, I don't know, it, I guess, like from standing too long is probably what he said. He explained he does not want to be mean to him but he's trying to teach him to be more respectful. He was asked about February 19, 2024. He made, Vic, he made Elijah stand to which he replied, ah, yeah, for probably like two to three hours. Then confirmed again that Elijah stands for two to three hours without sitting. In the event that Elijah tries to sit down, Vang will say, you want cold water? He then indicated, he's fine. It's not like his knees are shaking and about to fall over, you know. <laughs> Man, I hope somebody... T oh, Jesus. This guy, he almost needs to be... Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. Somebody in prison needs to take care of that one. On the morning of February 20th, 2024, Vang woke up at approximately 7.30 hours and prepared his son for school. At that time, he saw the victim sleeping on the futon sofa in the living room. Bang took his son to the bus stop and locked the apartment door. Upon returning to the apartment, Vang found Elijah still sleeping on the sofa. He woke Elijah up and they ate breakfast. He reported that Elijah ate some cereal, which had frosting on one side and wheat on the other, like frosted mini wheats, without milk. Then they went to uh, Vang's bedroom where victim was told to stand and pray. I don't know, man, maybe this guy's a predator, you know? I mean, really? He did not change the victim's diaper as he was too tired. Uh, Elijah was not allowed to do fun things as he was in a timeout. When asked about any toys at the apartment, Vang reported that there was one toy which he received at Christmas time. This toy was similar to a toolbox, however, it was not allowed to be to play with it during the week of February 12th through the 20th as he was in timeout. When asked what happens if the timeout, uh, let's see. When asked what happens if the timeout do not work with the victim, 
Vang stated that he would give him an ultimatum. Yeah, it doesn't sound too good. Hey, thanks, Bridget. Uh, Vang stated he would give him an ultimatum. Uh, Vang reported that the ultimatum was usually, do you want some cold water? Vang reported that victim did not like cold water, but did not know why. When asked about what the victim ate uh, while he was with Vang, he stated pizza, noodles, cereal, and similar items. He stated that Elijah was still bottle fed and he was trying to get him to eat regular food. He was unable to provide specific details as to the food. While Vang was sleeping, he would lock the door to the apartment at the doorknob deadbolt and with a security chain attached to the top of the door to keep the victim from walking out of the apartment. Well then how did he get out? Vang reported that one on the evening prior to the victim going missing, he had consumed three 12-ounce Budweiser beers and one cyclobenzaprine as a sleep aid. The information provide well, I mean, I mean, doesn't he just sort of admit right there by, you know, locking all those different doors and somehow he's not in the house that, you know, the kid didn't get out of the house by himself. Here, I'll put the, uh, the, no, the gold thing up on the screen just so you can see where we're at. All right. So this is the other one. I don't know if it's much different. That looks the same. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if there's any difference on these, right? I mean, aren't they the same? I'm kind of just reading them and timeouts. I guess that's from standing. Yeah, yeah, that's in there. Uh, then they went to Vang's bedroom where victim was told to stand and pray near the foot of Vang's bed. Yeah, it's the same. That's ex identical. So there you go. And so, so the mother lied. She was actually in the area multiple times. I think the mother was absolutely aware that something happened to Elijah. And I think uh, I wouldn't even be surprised if... I mean, he seems more likely to be the killer. <laughs> but she could easily have been. Like, she comes home and... You know, he's not acting the way that her boyfriend wants, so she tries to, you know, exact some punishment and does some hits him or something, and you know, ends up dying. And then they're like kind of scrambling around. I mean, one of the two killed him, right? It's probably more likely him if they're admitting that he's the one that would, you know, he's the punisher, right? So it seems more likely it's him. But you never know. I think she was totally aware. So I guess that's where we're at with that case. You know, same old place. So you guys have any, ex any other thoughts on that? I'm just going to move on to something else. Kind of idiot. 
it doesn't know that none of this makes a child act better. Well, yeah, three-year-old doesn't even know what's going on. Uh, they're just, you know. Yeah, so I got There's this one website out there for cold cases, and there's a ton and ton. Just a, you know, almost seems like almost half the cases are from Jacksonville, Florida. But amazingly, the newspaper, like newspapers.com and all the other archive sites, don't have a very good repository for Jacksonville, Florida. It's really frustrating. So because of that, they don't really, you know, there's nothing, it's hard to even look something up on them. But as you can see right now, you guys, look on the lower left-hand side of the screen right there. We're having a second night in a row of an extremely slow sort of, um, you know, <laughs> reaching the goal night, whatever the hell you want to call it. So if you're out there, uh, out of the 300 and something people watching, if you're able to help support the Gray Hughes Investigates channel that allows me to keep doing these shows and what we do at the end of the month, which is coming up here in three days. All right, I don't know what, what um, you know, what's changed or, you know, it's the same show. All right, uh, I know there's other people, more people doing shows now, so maybe that's what the problem is. All right, so this, uh, this only thing I could find on this lady right here, Kathy Lynn Boswell, is this article that was actually done in 2018 just on the regular so it happened in February 21st 1984 and it's sort of interesting because another person went missing from the she, she was a dancer at a a speakeasy I guess you know sort of a place where people would drink and you know I don't I don't even you know that seems like that was sort of an antiquated term but uh, when two dancers from the same Jacksonville show bar turned up dead investigators believed it might have been the work of a serial killer one of those cases was solved but the other was not and now decades later investigators believe a murder may still murder may still be on the loose in an action news Jack's partnerships with Jacksonville Sheriff's Office See, there it is, Project Cold Case. Like, she's in there, but that's it. There's no newspaper articles. There's no nothing. Trash Eaters Anonymous. Well, thanks. <laughs> we spoke with victim's sister and the detectives working on the case. Who killed Kathy Boswell? Uh, there's a thing here that says, uh, the mystery... Uh, you could help. Her remains were found on the side of highway in Baker County after she disappeared. So she was at a place here. I've got... Uh, hold on a second. So we're going down to Florida here. Yeah, so she worked in, I think it might even be over here. I think if you go back to, like, see that's a different building. I think it might be this one. Because as soon as we start moving forward, well, that'd be kind of interesting. You know what would be good to do here? Let's try to do this. So there might be, this got to have a street view from, I bet it's right there, that 5609, like whatever that is, I bet you if there's a Seymour, oh yeah, well it goes back to 2011, see that's Big Chief Tire, 
Hmm. But this is back in way back in. Uh, I don't see it. Yeah, so there's no more. Oh, wait, there's a 2007. I'm sure it's the same. 2011. I don't know. I don't know then. But the other building that I thought was this one over here, but it's at this intersection. And one of the video shots points over here. But you got a picture that even this right here is November 2007, and it took place in 1984. So, totally different. And there's Broken Scout again. Uh, the show from last night just wasn't that great, so I just removed it. But yeah, uh, the Broken Scout and Adnoram <laughs> that you see in here sometimes, they came uh, kind of like Cairo did, has done a few couple times. Came over, they met Blue and Chloe, and Adnoram uh, really liked Blue. Like, um, I mean, she liked both of them. I'm just saying, like, well, Blue liked hers, I guess is what I was trying to say. Like, he just sat there, and she just kept petting him. But he kept looking at me to see if it was okay. <laughs> I mean, it was weird. Um, so, good people. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, it was great meeting them. You know? I missed them as soon as they left. <laughs> They're pretty cool. But anyways, uh, yeah, we spent a few hours. Ate some food. Hung out. It's good stuff. Let's just see. So this was at the corner of University Boulevard. That's where she worked at a speakeasy uh, show bar called, uh, well, it was called Sands Speakeasy Show Bar. So Kathy Boswell was 27 years old, worked there as a dancer. It was the last place she was seen alive. The date was February 22nd, 1984. Her sister Karen St. Louis remembered that day well. I remember getting the call from my mother saying that Kathy was missing. Yeah, she, I think she even had a kid, too, I think. She said she knew right away that something was not right because of a phone call Boswell made before she disappeared. Kathy got off work. She called my mother and told my mother she was coming to see her. Boswell left her daughter, Jamie, at her babysitter's house. So she did have a daughter. The babysitter later called police when Boswell didn't show up. So it looks like Boswell left her daughter at the babysitter's house while she went to go dancing, a responsible thing to do, right? But then she never showed up to pick her daughter up at the babysitter's house. She would not ever have not picked her up. It just wasn't in her nature to be that way. Sergeant Dan Johnson with the Sheriff's Office said that about four months earlier, the body of another dancer from the same club had been found in a uh, burrow pit in St. John's County. Isn't that weird? So another dancer from the same club was found in a burrow pit in St. John's County. Yeah. The suspect in that case was William Darrell Lindsay. So there was a suspect and he is a convicted serial killer who died in prison in 2001, and I don't even think he was ever charged with that other murder. Because I looked up his victims, like if you go to William Daryl Lindsay here, and just Wikipedia, yeah. These are his victims. There's a October 1983. They're all in Florida. One's in, I guess, South, North Carolina over here. But that was 1996, his last victim. But there is none in 84. There's 83, 88, 89, and maybe 
Maybe there were 84, 85. They just weren't connected to him somehow. I bet this guy has way more victims than what you're seeing right there. Because I think you, it's possible that there's two more that we're just talking about right now, but we're never connected to him. Can I say specifically that he's responsible for Kathy's case? I can't say that at this point, but he certainly could be a person of interest, said Jansen. Let's see. Can I specifically? Okay, they're referring to the serial killer. Uh, said Johnson, I mean. Uh, St. Louis said there was someone else who made her worry. So I guess this lady's name is St. Louis? <laughs> St. Louis said there was someone else who made her worry about her sister. She had a boyfriend at the time who had a propensity for violence, and we knew this, and we were not happy at all, said St. Louis. But the boyfriend was not officially named a suspect. Where is this St. Louis? Her sister, Karen St. Louis. Wow, that's crazy. The suspect in the case was, okay, we already did that, uh, but the boyfriend was officially was never officially named a suspect. A few days after Boswell disappeared, the sheriff's office found her car at the Lions Gate apartment less than a mile from the club. And so there, are, there was a sort of um, a Lions Head apartments. I can't find a Lion Gate, but maybe these are the same one. That's point three. That's less than a mile, but it seems like if it was, you would have said less than a half mile, you know. So I don't know, but there's a lion's head apartments right here. And I could see that being the same. I bet you there's a gate that has a lion on it and then it changed the name. Let's see. I didn't even think of looking at that. Lion Google Earth here. Oh, there you go. Yeah, it's hard to, I don't know. What do you guys think? I bet there, uh, it could be the same one. I mean, it's right there. It'd be weird to have two apartments with the name Lion on it. Just right within a mile of each other. So, anyways, you might think that she just lived right here in those apartments. So a few days after Boswell's disappearance, the sheriff's office found her car at the Lionsgate Apartments less than a mile away from the club. So maybe she didn't live there. Okay, so obviously she didn't live there because they would have seen it right away. I don't think somebody brought it back. I just think that that's where they ended up finding it. There was a set of boots in the car and there was some initials written on the inside. And so we were concerned about that. Yeah, let me let me check something else out. Jackson. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Kathy. Boswell. I think it's L. Boswell. She'd probably be, how old would she be? 84, that's 40 years ago, 26, 50. She'd be 66. So I don't think she shows up in here. I could try that one, though. Well, I know you can't see because I'm not showing it to you, Richard Watts. 
it's uh, been verified. I don't put that normally on the screen. No, that's not it. Okay, so she's not in there. So there was a set of boots in the car, and there were some initials written on the inside, and so we were concerned about that, said Jansen. I guess that was Jansen earlier. Almost a year later, construction crews working just off of the I-10 East. All right, so let's see where that is. I-10 East. Uh, I-10 East. Jacksonville. Okay. So that's I-10 East. So probably. And then the other address was State Road 228. Okay, there's State Road 228. Does it run in over here? It says I-10, right? Also says 95. I-10 State Road. Let's see. I-10 and Okay, right here, I guess. That's I-10 in Florida 228. <coughs> so that would have been like right around in this area. They found human remains near a fence in a wooded area. About four years after that discovery, dental records confirmed the remains were those of Kathy Boswell. Baker County Detective Tracy Benton is now working on the case. She was a small female. She didn't weigh a lot. The killer just picked her up and dumped her over the fence, said Benton. Benton showed Action News Jack's the original case file which contained only a few pages and did not have much information compared to the file today, which is a lot thicker. Today's file from going through and gathering more information, said Benton. Together, JSO and Baker County Sheriff's Office believe the case can be solved. Hope has faded for St. Louis, but uh, she said it's not completely gone. I forgive the person who killed her. I prayed for the person that killed her, but... I would still like to know who it is, said St. Louis. Hey, thanks. Jessica Schubach. If you know of any information that could help solve this case or any other unsolved murder, call Crime Stoppers at 1-866-845-TIPS. I mean, that's how little... There isn't even another story on her in on Google, if you can believe that. So it's like... This is just one of those ones. I think it's very similar, if you think about it, to um, Mercedes Vega. You know, merely because she was a dancer, it just didn't get the the publicity that it should have, right? Oh, thanks, Bridget Bauman up there. I think I might have missed that one. And Barbara Town. I think I saw that one. 
I don't know. Hey, Rory, do you mind if we just stick with what we're doing here? Thanks. Jesus. <laughs> My God. Try to pay attention to the case. You know, it might have been something that uh, would have meant, meant something to you. You know what I mean? So, yeah, what a crazy thing. So, it sounds like she was, um, you know, she was working over at San Speakeasy. either here, 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 or here. I mean, maybe, maybe it was even that building. I don't know. But uh, she was working there, and her daughter was at her, uh, just a, a babysitter's house. And then she was going to go see her mom, but she never showed up to the mom, and she never picked up her daughter at the babysitter's house. And that's because somebody abducted and killed her, but she wasn't identified for, um, or her body was found a year later, and then four years later, they were able to identify her body after it was apparently thrown off somewhere, I don't know, maybe in this area, sounds like. Let me see what that looks like. Is anybody here? I mean, that there is no comments being. Yeah, so maybe the fence they're talking about is like over here or something. I don't know. Right. So that's what I'm saying. See, the, the, the amount of chat going on is equivalent to the support that I'm getting on the channel to reaching the goal. And that's just because you guys, just it's just not as interesting. That's not enough motivation to, you know what I mean? And this is not like, this is a like an experiment. <laughs> Basically, I've been doing this for a while. Every single night now that I cover something that isn't one of the big ones, you guys just... Like, yeah, whatever, you know. And it's, man, that is brutal. And it shows you exactly why these cases, just like this one, aren't being covered because nobody gives a shit. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. All right. Anyways, that's why, that's exactly why, same reason the cops don't do it, the same reason other creators don't cover these cases, is because it just doesn't work. All right? We've always been able to do it. But not anymore. So anyways, I got this other one here. We'll try to get through this. Uh, this is from back in 2014. And this is one of the victims here. I, I didn't see a picture online of the other one. But her name is, I think, Tisha Ball with a silent J, you know, T-J-H, three consonants in a row, pretty strange. Oh, see you later, Broken Scout. Uh, two young women from Tampa were found dead in Jacksonville this morning. Left tied up and naked along the side of the road, according to two witnesses. Deputies in Jacksonville say it was early this morning when they received a 911 call from witnesses. This is uh, back in September, probably 17, 2014. Deputies in Jacksonville say it was early this morning when they received a 911 call from witnesses who couldn't believe what they were seeing on the city's north side. I did a U-turn to see if it was a dead animal. That's when we saw that it was one laying on top of another that looked like they were tossed from the overpass. Jacksonville deputies later identified the victims as 19-year-old Angelia Ella Magna, er, Mangum of 18th Street in Tampa and 17-year-old Tisha Monique Ball of College Park Court. 
Investigators say the medical examiner would have to determine the exact cause of death, but witnesses described a sickening scene along Sisson Drive. They were naked, bound. They had like zip ties around their hands and their feet. Alton Souls recalled, they were hogtied uh, like wild animals. Tisha's stunned family said she was a stripper, so here we go again, who, ba who bounced around between Tampa and Jacksonville and had started hanging out with what they said was the wrong crowd. Her mother said she last spoke to Tisha two weeks ago and blamed herself for not seeing the warning signs earlier. I feel like sometimes, like I failed, like what could I have done? What could I have taught her better? She was the life of the party, Tisha's sister, Crystal Moore, offered. She was very brave and outgoing. I just don't understand what happened. Investigators in Jacksonville are asking for anyone with information to contact via Crime Stoppers at 1-866-845-TIPS. Right, so this one actually was in the newspaper, but it's more recent. It's the old ones that aren't in there. The last time Jerlene Moore talked to her daughter on the phone, she sang her a song. Tisha Monique Ball, who was living in Jacksonville at the time, put her mother on speakerphone. Uh, so her friend could hear her sing uh, Sage the Gemini's song, Red Rose. It was a song they both loved. She was a good girl, said Moore, who affectionately called her daughter T. She loved everybody. She was very sharing. Uh, let's see. She was very sharing and giving. She was the sweetest little thing. This is the other girl. She, um, she just loved everything. She was happy and bubbly she was outgoing on thursday afternoon a tampa police officer came to the moore's home and told her her 18 year old daughter had been found dead along with her friend 19 year old angelia ella mangum on a roadside in jacksonville a witness told a reporter with first coast news in jacksonville that the woman the women were found hogtied in a pool of blood Deputies on Thursday would not confirm that or a cause of death, citing the ongoing investigation. Um, someone saw the body shortly before 2 a.m. and called the police, said Sheriff's Office spokesman Christian Hancock. Deputies have no suspect at this time, he said. Moore said she still hasn't been able to process the news of her daughter's death. It's just crazy, Moore said. I'm numb. I don't, uh, let's see what it said. I don't know. There's a lot of things running around in my head. It could be anything. Hey, welcome, Barbara Town, to Oogla Boogla Freaks. Man, you're one of the first people in probably like months that bought the Oogla Boogla one instead of the, the, the lowest level one right out of the gate. So thank you. <laughs> Isn't that amazing? There's a lot of things running around in my head. It could be anything, she said. Can't understand what happened. She's hoping someone calls and tells, their, uh, tells her they mistakenly identified her daughter as a victim. She was strong-minded, said Moore 55. Whatever she set her mind to do, that's what she was going to do. She wasn't afraid. And I can uh, trustly say that whatever happened to her, she went down with a fight. She just didn't go down like a little weakling. Ball was born in Lakeland, the youngest of four children. At the age of nine, Ball moved with her oldest sister to Tampa. Moore later moved to Tampa as well. Ball was a tomboy growing up, Moore said. As she grew up, she got into fashion, clothes, and having the latest hairstyle, Moore said. About two years ago, she started doing exotic dancing. 
Yeah, it's sort of, it is interesting. I mean, obviously that profession's just way more dangerous than any, just being a waitress or something. About two years ago, she started doing exotic dancing. I'm kind of, I mean, I'm sort of thinking about Mercedes Vega's case as we're going through this and these other ones, you know, just, I think it's gonna, I, I actually think it's gonna end up being just some guy that knew her from that place or something, some weird, you know, just hanging around one night with the wrong crowd in that world, something like that. She was strong-minded, said more 55, whatever she set her mind to, to do, she was going to do that. Uh, Ball was born, we already went that. Uh, Ball was a tomboy growing up, more said as she grew up. She got into fashion, clothes, and having the latest hairstyle. Today, though, a parent would just tell her to have an operation and become the, the boy instead of letting them actually develop later in life, you know. About two years ago, she started doing exotic dancing and would stay in Jacksonville with Mang Mangum for long stretches of time. Both were strip dancers in Jacksonville where it was more lucrative for them. She said Ball had a boyfriend, but that she never met him. She had never met him. They would spend several months in Jacksonville living with friends, Moore said, then come back to Tampa for a time, she said. Mangum was raised in Tampa with foster families. Her mother lost custody of her and young age, Moore said. Mangum and Ball met as teenagers and were close friends, Moore said. She described Mangum as sweet and polite. She was always respectful, Moore said. She described Mangum as sweet, or as she was always respectful, Moore said. She would stick up for Ball, though, Moore said. If T got in a fight, she's going to jump in, Moore said. They were like sisters. They were together. They were a team. They died together. Records show Ball was arrested in Jacksonville last year. Where is that? Jacksonville crime scene. Jacksonville roadside where the bodies were found. Hmm. Now, records show Ball was arrested in Jacksonville last year on a cocaine possession charge. She also was arrested for a traffic violation in Tampa in April. Mangum has been arrested in Hillsborough County several times on charges of burglary and violation of probation records show. Moore said her daughter would jump in a car with a stranger. She would take care of herself, uh, she said. She speculates that her daughter knew the person who killed her. Whoever did this to her you need to be ashamed of yourself, Moore said. Thou shall not kill, justice will be served. Before moving to her current home on Lakeshore Drive, Moore lived on North 15th Street with Ball. People in the neighborhood who knew the family had heard the news Thursday afternoon. I feel bad for them, said Mario Foons, who manages the apartment uh, complex where Moore and Ball lived on North 15th Street. They are a great family. She was such a nice girl, and she respected everybody. She was so friendly. No one thought they uh, would, nobody thought they would hurt her. Who's they? No one thought they would hurt her. She was such a nice girl, and she respected everybody. She was so friendly. No one thought they would hurt her. Huh. That almost, uh, you know, that's <laughs> kind of an odd statement there. Who's, who's the they? Well, it's almost like you have knowledge of somebody. Herbert Myers knew Ball when she was a young girl growing up on North 15th Street. He was stunned by the news. She was a sweet little girl, Myers said. She minded her business and didn't give anybody any trouble. Whatever happened, it wasn't worth it to take somebody's life like that, Myers said. So those are them right here.
Authorities have identified two women whose bodies were found alongside Jacksonville Road. So that's already, you know, that's the same day, but they, you know, obviously that other one's a later story that somebody got. So then September 20th, Killing Shock Friends Family. I think we already got enough of the background, so I'm going to move on to the next one. Two murders of young Tampa women whose bodies were discovered Thursday morning by the side of a wooded Jacksonville road remain a mystery. No suspects have been named and the causes of death have not been announced, a spokeswoman for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office said Monday. The agency also has not commented on witnesses reports that victims Angelia Ella Mangum and we'll just say uh, Mangum and Ball were discovered bound and in a pool of blood. Ball's mother, Geraldine Moore, 55, of Tampa, said her daughter began working as a dancer a few years ago. Ball had been going back and forth from Tampa to Jacksonville for the past two and a half years, uh, Moore said. She said her daughter and Mangum were close friends. And this is in a, you know, in Google article. So I think this one, this one's by uh, Ian Blair on Salon.com. Grizzly murder ignored. How we failed Angelia Mangum and Tisha Ball. Yep, there you go. See, they're noticing it. <clears throat> in the wee hours of balmy, eerily calm morning in North Jacksonville, Florida last Thursday, the lifeless bodies of two teenage girls, Angelia Mangum and Tisha Ball, were discovered alongside a somewhat remote s stretch of road just east of Interstate 95 and west of US-17, allegedly naked, bound with zip ties, lumped on top of each other, surrounded by a pool of blood. Two witnesses driving past on Sishon Drive near the intersection of Main Street, let's see, Main Street North and Clark Road. So this is also in Jacksonville, but you know, years later. Yeah, so I think it's that, right? Isn't it that overpass? I'm trying to compare it. So that one, I don't know. Is there another overpass or is this just, that doesn't look the same. I mean, I see in this picture, but there's an overpass, but there's a road that goes under it and that's not what you see there. I guess it's possible it changed over the years, but <coughs> I don't know. But that's the same, this is Clark Road and North Main Street. Main Street North and Clark Road. Yeah, that's that's the uh, that's the spot. <coughs> Don't know why there's uh, doesn't look the same. Probably just 
re, re you know they changed the look of the highway I guess Two witnesses driving past on Sitchin Road Drive near the intersection of Man well, we'll see where Sitchin Drive is. Let's just make sure. <coughs> yeah, well, there you go. Oh, is it right there? Oh, I see. Okay, it's like here. There's the road going underneath the overpass. So let's see if we go right there. Now oh, there you go. So now wow, that matches the newspaper article right there. See that? Alright, so it's right over here. So they were just bodies were just put right there. That's crazy. So what do you say guys? Is there any chance of trying to even come close to reaching the goal tonight or is this just another Lost cause. What do you guys say? Any chat? Let's see. Uh, so the driving pass on Sitchin Drive near the intersection of Main Street North and Clark Road said they initially thought they saw a corpse. So they flipped a U-turn to see if they could determine whether it was a human body or simply a dead animal roadkill. On second glance, it appeared to be a former. Upon confirming their initial suspicions, one witness, Jason Brown, as he recounted to Jacksonville WFOX TV Channel 30, said it looked like they were tossed from the overpass. The two passerby, the two passerby then hurried, dialed 911. Hey, thanks, Daniel, to notify law enforcement authorities. Dispatched to the scene, arrived, and immediately suspected foul play, according to local ABC affiliate WJXT and the Tampa Bay Times. Although what exactly happened to Mangum 19 and Ball 18 remains unclear, autopsies have been ordered. No suspects have been named. No arrests have been announced. The details of and circumstances surrounding Mangum and Ball's uh, untimely and gruesome death have been primary, primarily confined to local media in the Duval County area. Huh? You think they've colluded? What, what are you talking about? Uh, which is to say their story is curious and shocking. The details of the circumstances surrounding Mangum and Ball's old untimely and gruesome deaths have been primarily confined to local media in the Duval County area, which is to say their story, curious and shocking as it may be, hasn't made much more than a blip on the mainstream media radar. Why this is the case is difficult to determine. However, a few familiar hypotheses is, seem to be making their way to the forefront. Considering the ongoing coverage of the missing University of Virginia student, Hannah Graham, who allegedly was abducted, oh yeah, I remember that one, by Jesse Matthew, a portly 6'2", 270-pound black man with dreadlocks. That would have been a huge case now because there was surveillance footage. And who was wanted on suspicion of abduction with the intent to defile, according to Charlottesville Police Chief Timothy Longo. One might suppose the lack of collective interest by the press is uh, related, but not limited to the intersection of the race and class of the victims. To this accord, Ebony Senior Editor, uh, yeah, so that, that's what I always say too. It's the same thing. So I guess the answer was no to my previous question, but thank you, Danielle. Let's see. Uh, Mangum and Ball were investigators. Uh, yeah, it's hard to... Questions that are sadly not new. Pleading for national media outlets, which include among its ranks, the publication to give the case of these two young black teenage girls the kind of attention and diligent reporting that deserves 
a, a rightly so, their, their story matters. And here we are covering it. But see why we don't do these? I mean, the, like a night like this is proving exactly why the news outlets don't cover these stories like this. See, like look how it is in here. It's the same thing. It just doesn't work, you know. They've got, uh, you know, they got to make the revenue on their uh, outlets. They've got to, and see this? This is the worst night that this channel's had in this entire year. And here we are covering two cases that nobody's talked about. And that proves exactly why these people don't cover them. Because nobody's interested. I am gray. Okay. All right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear that every time. Hear it every time. Let's see. As with many stories with uh, where race and class take center stage and where black victims uh, lie slain, the character of the victims as well as their complete history of personal choices, family flaws, and the victims economic and social circumstances has colored the narrative from the Tampa Bay Times. State records show that both women had criminal records. Ball was arrested last year in Jacksonville on felony cocaine charge record show, but the charge was dropped. In April, she was arrested in Tampa by Florida Highway Patrol on a misdemeanor charge of driving without a valid license. Thank you, Sirius Black. The records also show that Magnum was arrested twice as a juvenile on burglary and larceny charges in Hillsborough County. More recently, she uh, last year, she faced a charge of failing to appear in Hillsborough Court on a burglary charge. It has also been reported that either one or both of the victims had been working in Jacksonville as exotic dancers at a nearby gentleman's club. The inclusion of the wildly Tangential, unrelated tidbit to paint the portrait of the victim sparked outrage throughout the sex worker activity community who have been raising funds and awareness about the case. And in Lamo, who accurately lambasted it as a victim blaming and irrelevant, among other things. Yeah, it's just a dangerous, I mean, it's, you know. It is irrelevant. The killer is the killer. It's just sort of like they're in a dangerous world, but it should, shouldn't make people less interested in the story. Such outrage echoes similar sentiment in the wake of the death of Michael Brown, an 18-year-old black kid from Ferguson, Missouri, who was killed in broad daylight by... Uh, I, I'm not going to go to get into this crap here. I don't agree with any of this shit over here. Um, that Wilson fired upon blah, blah, blah. That, that Michael Brown one was ridiculous. <laughs> Jesus. He just stole something from it. See, nobody ever tells the truth on that story. Each time this has occurred, uproar has ensued after the New York Times remarkably referred to Brown as a no angel. Well, he wasn't. Public intellectuals such as Tahis Coates and da 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 forcibly dismantled the off sided idea that a victim lack of perfection. No, but that's not the case. Uh, he went after the police officer. That's the part you're leaving out. That uh, these the citing a case like that is idiotic to me. What you got to cite are the just the hordes of normal crime cases out there where people because that was a huge case in the media. Huge, right? You got to cite cases like uh, just like these two right here, boom. Which, would, if they were two white girls, would have been a massive story. Hog tied, found on top of each other. Uh, and this is from October of 2014. I think that's the mom over there. Tampa teen's mother hopes for closure. 
No such thing. Charlene Moore wakes up each morning between 5 and 6 and says a prayer for the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office homicide detectives investigating her, her daughter's death. I just pray every day that God protect the detectives that are working on this case and that today I'll hear something that this will be resolved. Resolution could take a while, more, more than uh, a month after her daughter and daughter's friend were slain in Jacksonville. Investigators haven't arrested anyone in the case, identified a suspect, or released a description of a suspect. They also haven't released a possible motive as to why Moore, Moore's daughter, 18-year-old Tisha Monique Ball, and Ball's friend, 19-year-old uh, Angelia Mangum, were killed. The bodies of Ball and Mangum were found on the side of the road in a pool of blood on the night of September 18th. Moore said the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office told her both women had been hogtied and thrown from an overpass. So that's crazy, right? I mean, that means uh, so they were thrown off of this. So if you can get up on top of it. Yeah, just pulled over on this. Looks like it's not a very highly traveled, you know, probably at some time at night it's not really traveled too much. And then just got out of the car and they were both thrown off the side right there. A little bit farther back to, to about right here. Oh, just straight up above there. And I mean, it's pretty high, but I don't know if it would have killed both to be thrown off of that. So who knows where the blood's from the fall or prior to that. They were close friends, two peas in a pod. Yeah, I think we've pretty much covered all this stuff. This was in that first article, some of it. In 2015, hey, thanks, Cheryl. Progress in slang seems slow. Darlene Moore bought a copy of the same dress she buried her younger daughter in to frame uh, in her home, a wooden frame. Let's see. Moore's daughter, Tisha Monique Ball, 18, and her friend Angela Ella Mangum, 19, were brutally murdered in North Jacksonville in September. Tampa teenagers were found naked, and so they were naked too, and hogtied, and in a pool of blood on the side of the road as if they were thrown off the overpass. Nine months later, no motive, suspects, or arrests have been released. Moore has yet to receive her daughter's official cause of death from the Jacksonville Sheriff's Office, she said. I'm still touchy, Moore said. I'm trying to accept things and try to get better at dealing with it, but I have good days and bad days. Let me see if there's, what page is that? Two, so 23. The duo story has generated articles in national publications like Salon, well, that's the one we just read a few minutes ago, dot com and Ebony Magazine questioning why. But see, here's the thing is, <laughs> you know, so even Salon and Ebony Magazine, they didn't just take the opportunity to report and cover it. They covered it in the way only just to say, how come nobody's covering this? Well, maybe, if, you know, you guys had really looked into it deeper and try to figure some shit out, you could have turned it into a bigger story instead of just doing the complaining angle of nobody covering it because you were two big publications that could have just covered it and then maybe it would have spread, but you didn't do that. So that's kind of interesting to think about it like that. The sex worker advocacy group, everybody 
raised $13,208 through an online fundraiser to help cover the funeral expenses. The sheriff's office says laws prohibit the release of information on an ongoing investigation. Well, unless Grady Judd was doing it, he would have given everybody a lot of stuff. Despite the teenager's lifestyle, they were never rejected or treated differently by friends or family. They met as teens, quickly became like sisters. Ball grew up with her family in College Park Apartments at North 15th Street. Uh, Mangum was the youngest of five. Mangum moved from the children's home around 2009 to another group home in Temple Terrace and attended Freedom High School. Uh, Yeah, I mean, it sounds like they were just, like, everybody really liked these two people, except for some psycho out there. And that's Mangum there. It's pretty cute. And this is, uh, this is the only thing I, on uh, Project Cold Case, it shows up in the database, but there's nothing really even written on it. Now, and this is a story in TampaBay.com, but I don't have a prescription for it. So, subscription, I mean, so I can't see it. So. Well. I, w I don't know what I was going to I was just going <laughs> to, like I was going to cover that stuff and then maybe work on my 3D thing again, but man, you guys. I mean, I'll show you on the screen. That's, that's where we're at on the, on the screen up there on the upper right. That's the worst night we've ever had on this, on this channel. And I apologize if my work hasn't been good enough for you guys, all right? I don't know what, what makes it different, <laughs> you know? Really uh, stressful. Yeah, well, Jacksonville has a ton of cases that are unsolved, like more than I've ever seen anybody else. <laughs> I don't know, you guys. I don't know. Seems like it should be pretty simple. All right. So, yeah, after the show last night, I spent a lot of time putting in the various paths and everything. And I'm just going to use little balls for different the three girls are right here you know they're just going to be three balls and then Abby and Libby are going to be sort of like the tie-dye and then the tan coat of Abby this one here will be um, Betsy Blair then in black over here that's going to be the Richard Allen character moving around on the path. So we'll probably have it kind of zoom. Ooh, I don't want to do that. Just took it off of its thing. Hey, thanks, Linda Howe. Yeah, it's not looking very likely that <laughs> people are going to jump on that one. But hey, thank you. Linda Molden Howe of the cattle mutilations and crop circle. It really isn't that big. What are you what are you talking about, the Krista? Don't know what you mean. Nobody has a clue what you're saying. 
Gotta type a full sentence there. Yeah, so I'm gonna use um, every six frames is gonna be a second. So that's how I'm gonna do it. I wonder if I should make these bigger. Even though the path isn't that big, but you know, I mean, I could come in and well, I just want to do it all from the top. So there'd be time if it's like that. Is that might be wait? Am I, not, I think I maybe I can't see some people on here. I don't see anything from uh, Lesney Mija Zozo. Is there something I'm missing here? Or? Oh, a cash app. Okay. Um, thanks to uh, WNC Granny earlier and uh, Miss Angels PayPal and then also Lesney on Cash App. Maybe I'll make these just a little bit bigger. Let's see. Maybe more like that. Yeah. I don't know. So the very first thing that's going to be moving are these girls here. So it's weird because they were just like hanging out at this park for a long time. Like they weren't really doing much. I mean, 1243 and then 126, they're over at the the bench over here. To right there. Hold on, what's the name of that one? Three girls to the bench. Three girls bench. Oh, okay, right there. Do it like that. Well, Linda, you give it a shot. <laughs> See what I'm saying? <laughs> it's wild, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter if it's hugging right in there or not. Okay, well, here we go. Animation, constraints, path constraint, and it goes to... Uh, 
Oh crap, which, which is the one? Right. Uh, okay, I'm gonna have to hide all these other ones. Girls, bridge to bench. Okay, so everything else has to be hidden. No, oh, not that. Okay. Thanks, Sandy Shirley. is crazy so I had this thing I was trying to build over here so it's 30 frames 66 frames the projected length would be all right so from I gotta get out this map over here Yeah, we just weren't sure what, what you were saying up above, Krista. You said, okay, it's not big, the this, this city isn't big. Okay. So it's 43 and then 126. So that would be 17 plus 26, which is uh, 43, right? 17 plus 26 is 43 minutes. So over here, this would be 43 minutes. Okay. Minute. So that would be 15,480 frames. So I guess you'd have to say equals divided by 30. So 516 seconds. <laughs> so what the hell is that though? Okay. Divided by 30. And then divided by 60. That's like eight minutes. Does that sound about right? Yeah, right. Because four times, or six times that would be, ah, shit. I, I, easier way to do it is just take uh, 43 minutes. 43 divided by, uh, Five. Oh, it's the same thing. So it is 8.6. So that did work. The way I had that a second ago. So it's 8.6 minutes. So that's what we do is, you know, so you go to 8. Point six minutes, but they do have it in frames over here. Ah, man. So I get, have to switch that back to just five hundred and sixteen frames. Okay. Does that, does that even make sense? No, it's five hundred and sixteen seconds is what that is. by 30. So that gives you the number of seconds, but I need the number of frames. So it's 15,480. So that's right here. 
Oh, let me, I guess I'm going to have to, can I just type it in? Yeah. 15480. That's where the keyframe right there goes. Sweet. So there you go, that's going to be sped up. That's how, that's the pace, even though it still looks slow as hell. <laughs> you know, so that's the thing is these, I'm going to speed it up dramatically, but you can see right there, look. But that's even sped up a lot because there's 43 minutes of time where they don't really go very far. So if I just speed it up using, you know, put, going like that, it... Uh, we'll go right to the bench, right? So they go to the bench right there. So that's pretty good. Just having that. And they're at the bench at 126. So that movement's all by itself with no cars around. However, a car comes in because Richard Allen's car drives by here at 127. Hey, thanks, Bridget Bauman. What do you mean you, you can't hear me? You can't hear me? You can't hear me right now? Can you hear me? Yeah, it's just you. You got to fix your microphone or your headphones or something. Hey, yeah, uh, Krista, though. Hey, Krista, the show isn't about you, though. I just want to let you know. Okay, so you either quit talking about your little struggles you're having tonight in the chat or just watch, okay? I mean, I don't know what your deal is. Like, every single comment you've made, I know it's entertaining for you. May I may, you know, I guess the show isn't really that entertaining tonight to people, okay? I can tell. Right, and that's really kind of the stuff that makes me angry, and I don't know what else to do. I, I just do the shows, you know. People used to like the shows. I'm doing them exactly the same way. There's no difference. Um, yeah, I know, but quit... Commute talking to him, the Krista. Move on, you know. Hey, Sharon, did you uh, get a hold of uh, Mama She 13? I think this is a record, though, for a night where not even one super chat came in that was um, ten dollars. <laughs> you know, normally that we get like a 20 and a 10 and 50s and there isn't one, so I'm wondering if that's the thing, you know. Pretty pretty odd. That's the first time I've ever seen that. Ah, uh, no thanks, Danielle. I'm, I'm done with the feedback shit. Absolutely done with the feedback. I'm not going to keep saying it. Yeah, no, I don't need the feedback. I've already heard the feedback. I know what the feedback is. It's the same. Uh, you, you always try to give me advice, and I'm just not interested in it. Okay? All right.
I just put this car in here? Import file. What happened? Oh man. That thing's huge compared to my setup over here. Oh my god. Could you make more comments next time, uh, uh, Danielle, in a row? Jesus. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve comments in a row. Oh, cool. Sharon, that's good. Excellent. So this will be the a uh, black vehicle here. Uh, the young woman in the it's almost like she uh, runs like uh, on one of the troll groups out there it's bizarre you know I don't even know what you're saying <laughs> Jesus it's unbelievable No, I don't think so. I don't need to have 15 comments in a row on there. All right, guys. I'm going to head off for the night. But thank you all for being here. Appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Terry, Bolton, Eugenie, K. Me, Allie, Kate, Kubi, 8675309, Barbara Town, Bridget Bauman, uh, Trash Eaters Anonymous, Jessica Schubach, uh, Danielle, Sirius Black, Cheryl, Linda Howe, Sandy Shirley, and Bridget Bauman. Thanks, everybody. And be safe out there. Yeah, I've been doing this true crime thing for quite a while now. And during this whole time, I have not seen one person that is a crime dissector. Flag rejecter. I'm a certified human lie detector. Gonna get ya. On a stretcher, if you try and play me like an old projector, crime sector is my nectar. Professor Gray is gonna give another lecture. Crime collector, freak connector, and I'm always gonna be a pup protector, fool deflector, interceptor, and I'm meaner than a specter with a vector on his pector. With all respect, y'all, just remember I've a temple fucking check ya. I have no agenda. I'm no pretender, and I'll serve it to you straight without the blender. And in the end, I'm gonna send ya on a mission to reveal the true offender. Yeah, so I'll just get right back to work. All right, everybody, talk to you.